I'm going to uh, really talk a little bit about using winter hardy uh, species uh, for forage in the spring. And so what I wanted to talk about is uh, really just your options. But before we get there, is everybody seeing my screen? My slides? All right. So before we get there, I wanted to take just a step back because Callie alluded to the idea that planting dates extremely important uh, for success of those winter sensitive cool season species. And as she said, September 1st is really that kind of that drop dead date that I typically use to say it's time to switch and the switch is going to winter hardy cool season species or winter hardy uh, species like rye, uh, winter wheat or uh, winter triticale. Um, one of the things that I did want to point out is, as Callie alluded to, the, the corn silage system where we even planted a little bit later, which actually was about the same time as the high moisture corn, you saw it wasn't profitable. So normal harvested corn silage probably doesn't fit the winter sensitive uh, cool season species like oats. Um, so normal harvested or late harvested corn silage is probably a system uh, for the winter hardy cool seasons. Uh, you could do that with high moisture corn as well, or of course dry corn. And you can see the dates I have here, September 1 to November 1st, and we'll talk a, a little bit about that in just a second. Uh, before I move on, I do want to mention we used oats in this particular trial because of some herbicide restrictions, and that was one of the questions uh, that we got in the survey was about herbicides, and uh, I think that's a great question. Herbicide restrictions are uh, one of the things that really limits your options in many systems. So I wanted to point you to this document and I will uh, put this in the chat and I will also um, send this out in an email. But uh, this is a NEB guide that Amit Jahala and uh, myself, as long as a few other co-authors, put together where we actually just kind of pulled together uh, common herbicide labels and looked at options for what you could put in after uh, corn or soybeans uh, that would fit in terms of that plant back restriction. So, so this document kind of goes through what you need to look at on the label. And I will say this, this particular uh, document is about four years old. And so there may be some new herbicides and there may also be some changes to herbicide labels. So you should always look at your herbicide label. Uh, but there's a lot of blanks here, as you can see in this first table, this is pre-emerge herbicides on corn. These blanks are not because there's no restriction. These blanks are because the restriction is too long to be able to use that species to get any kind of growth. So you can see there's uh, limited options, especially when we start looking at uh, brassicas, or if we look at really our only uh, overwintering legume that works in Nebraska, which would be, be vetch. Uh, you know, you can see there's a lot of blanks, not a lot of options to be able uh, to plant something. And so we had that same restriction on our experiment, and that's why we chose just to go with oats. But I do want to point out that I do like brassicas in the system if you can make it work with your herbicides. And this is actually, we did a side-by-side -side trial of uh, three pounds of rapeseed and 50 pounds of oats versus 100 pounds of oats. Um, we can get the same yields across those two. Um, we can get a little bit better forage quality uh, with the oats plus rapeseed. We can lower the seeding costs, which I really like. Um, I'm cheap, so this is only about 15 bucks an acre. This was about 20 to 23 dollars an acre. And then I have on here, this is average daily gains in a side-by-side -side comparison over a few years. This is actually statistically different. We could pick up a, a little bit over a tenth of a pound a day gain difference. So I do like them, uh, but they're kind of hard to fit in. So uh, that's one of the big limitations in our forage systems. Now, if you're just doing strictly a cover crop, the herbicide restrictions are less of a concern. You can still have some plant injury and those type of things, uh, but it's not illegal uh, to use it. Whereas in a system where you're going to use this forage, it is technically illegal not to follow uh, the herbicide label. Okay, so moving on to fall planting and, and our options. Um, options are limited. We have about four species here on my list. Uh, most people are familiar with cereal rye. It's quite popular. Um, there's a few reasons why it's popular, uh, one of which is that it tends to uh, come on quite early. It's very uh, winter hardy. 
Um, but some other options would be winter wheat and winter triticale. And uh, the only really uh, legume that we can get to overwinter uh, that might be useful in forage would be hairy vetch, although there's some issues with hairy vetch when it gets mature and toxicity in certain um, strains of cattle. It's kind of interesting. Some cattle don't have problems at all and some cattle um, can get uh, a lot of problems. They get photosynthesis, or photosynthesis, that'd be great, photosensitivity. Um, so they basically can get sunburn and it can be bad enough to where you have to put them down. So a lot of people try not to use it just because they don't like that risk. Uh, so thinking about uh, within these species, I'm going to show you a little bit of data that we have uh, that we're working through right now, but I did want to point out variety matters. And even within a species, there's differences in varieties. And we do have um, a great uh, winter wheat breeder in Nebraska and also uh, it works with triticale. And so there's more options, I think, in the winter wheat and winter triticale for selecting a variety that might fit uh, your soil type and your growing conditions a little better. So that's one of the things that I like about them. Cereal rye, there's not really as many uh, breeders, uh, and honestly, there's not really a lot of options. We'll tell you, though, that there is some differences. Uh, we can sometimes get Elbon rye, which is a southern rye. Uh, and if we compare it to variety non-stated, which tends to be northern ryes that we can get in Nebraska that are variety non-stated, we do see a difference in terms of when they break dormancy. And so the southern ryes come on a little bit earlier in the spring. And so if you're thinking about grazing, that can be an advantage because it helps fill that, that gap a little bit earlier. Uh, one disadvantage is that they hit maturity earlier. And so for some people, uh, that might be a drawback. But at the same planting date, um, we can see that, uh, this, that planting Elbon rye versus variety on stated, uh, the stages are a little bit different. The yields are a little bit different, as you might imagine um, this L bond's a little bit further along. So advantages and disadvantages, but something to consider. If I was going further north of here from Nebraska, I might steer clear just because uh, because it breaks dormancy a little bit earlier. The southern rye um, may get caught in a cold snap and you might have some freeze damage. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to mention is that the planting date matters, as you might expect. Uh, so in most of Nebraska, really September 18th is the date at which we start reducing yield uh, when we plant later than that. However, I do want to point out even October 10th, we're still about 80% of the relative yield that we would get in the spring if we planted at an earlier date, uh, September 18th or earlier, if that makes sense. So we do get some yield drag with our later planting, so dry corn, uh, systems, you are not going to get quite as high a yield as you would if uh, you had planted a little bit earlier, like our high moisture corn or our uh, corn silage system. So corn silage is uh, really a great place for these winter hardy species. If it's not really early harvested, then doing something uh, like planting these winter hardy species could really help you increase uh, your forage potential, but also provide you, of course, that soil cover. As Lindsay alluded to, we have some uh, increased risk of erosion. And so I really think uh, this is a great place to put in these winter hardy species in the corn silage systems. So Callie also was doing some work with wheat, rye, and triticale in the spring. So we did side by side comparisons where we grazed calves. We started grazing at about five to six inches. Uh, our stocking rates were about six calves in a one acre paddock, and then we had actually two, two acres allocated, so we rotated back and forth uh, between uh, two one acre paddocks. Uh, this is what it looked like when we would move them off and rotate to the new paddock, so it's about two to three inches. And again, about five inches when we went ahead and, and started grazing. So rye came on a little bit earlier, as you might expect we did have variety non-stated rye but April 3rd is when we were able to get out there and then April 10th for the triticale and wheat. Again this is just a picture of what it looked like when we were moving off of um, the paddocks to go to uh, the next paddock to start grazing. 
And I told you we did uh, basically what would be the equivalent of three calves an acre, and that wasn't quite enough. Uh, we needed a little bit more acreage. I think if we had two calves an acre, and such that we had three paddocks, and we were able to rotate among the three paddocks, it would have worked really, really slick. One thing we did see, since we were early grazing, we did see some frost damage um, where they were grazing in particular. You could see it where they had a hoof impact when it was frozen. You, see, you saw that material start dying off. We also had a situation where we got a cold spell during our grazing period. We grazed till about May 15th and we didn't get the regrowth that we were expecting um, on the paddock that we had previously grazed. And that's kind of what it looked like. And so this is why I was saying I really thought if we had uh, three acres uh, for six calves, or basically a stocking rate of two calves uh, per acre, or equivalent of about one cow an acre, that would be probably optimum. The thing we really want to do is make sure that we keep it vegetative. And so we really do have to stock it fairly heavy. I'm going to uh, now just ask you what you think uh, the calves performed while they were uh, out there grazing. So uh, just tell me if you thought they grazed about a pound a day, if they gained about two pounds a day, three pounds a day, or four pounds a day. And I'll let you guys just answer that real quick and then we'll go ahead and uh, Okay, so it looks like the majority of people will just go ahead and end the poll um, and share the results here. The majority of people said that they thought they would gain about two pounds a day. So uh, I'll tell you that in our situation, they actually gained four pound a day uh, while they were out on the wheat, triticale or rye. We really didn't see a lot of difference among the species, uh, but I will also tell you that uh, these calves were a bit green when they went out. They were only gaining about a pound a day all winter, and so we did get some compensatory growth. Uh, so if you said about 25% uh, of those gains was just due to compensation or the extra gain you get when you have them on a restricted growth, um, that'd be about three pound a day. Previous studies that we've done on Elbon rye, we got about 3.2 pound a day. So uh, bottom line, I think we can uh, get really good gains uh, on these calves. And I know a lot of you may or may not have calves during this time period. Uh, if you background them on stocks, for instance, this could be a great way to get them into that May market um, so that you could uh, basically sell them into the grass market. That's one thing I think could be a really nice system. The other option is to use this for lactating cows. I do know some people that uh, use these winter hardy species for calving cows out on uh, the fields and they really like it because they can move them to uh, a clean location, they can get spread out and uh, it's not a dirt cover. And so um, this is a great way uh, to calve, especially if you're calving um, early in the season. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about briefly is uh, I wanted to talk about using wheat triticale and rye for silage. And so what I have here, this is a picture uh, in boot stage. And so I wanted to show you what this, what this really looks like. This is basically the head is still in, in the stem. It hasn't elongated out. And so you can kind of see it's bulged out right there. Um, so it's very vegetative in boot. Um, we can get very high quality. This was about 19% crude protein. Uh, so very high crude protein. Um, and I'll show you the yields in just a second. The next stage we really looked at was anthesis. And you can see the head's fully elongated, sorry. Uh, the head's fully elongated, and you can see uh, the pollen ha has just coming out here. Um, that's also fairly decent quality. And then the next stage we looked at would be uh, milk stage. And I don't really have a great picture of milk stage, but if you take a kernel and uh, 
out of the head and you squeeze it, you're gonna get a little bit of milky substance out of it. That would be milk stage. I will tell you, we had pronghorn wheat and, and about milk stage, we had some high winds and you can see it did lodge. So uh, the wheat seemed to lodge worse than the triticale or the rye in this system. The last stage that we're gonna look at is soft dough. And for soft dough, uh, you would just take that kernel and if you were to pinch it, you would have um, really what looks like dough. And so two things to note is that if you harvested at milk or anthesis, um, you did have to wilt it. So you would have to cut it and let it sit and dry out a little bit before you could chop it because it's too wet. If we harvested at milk or soft dough, it seemed like we could do a direct harvest. So just to show you the dates at which they kind of hit those stages, um, these were planted October 15th. And you can see that the uh, rye and triticale both hit uh, boot stage earlier than the wheat, which is what I expected. But what I didn't expect is that the wheat actually seemed to start catching up. So it was actually earlier in anthesis than the other two. And then at milk, it hit about the same stage, the same time and then soft dough, it hit it earlier. So I actually expected the opposite, that wheat was gonna be slower, and in fact, it was a little bit faster, which I thought was intriguing. Um, if we look at the yields, this is on dry matter basis, if we look at the yields per acre, as you would expect, boot stage had lower yields, and our yields tended to increase as we went down to soft dough, which is also expected as it got more mature. One of the things you might note is that Ryan Triticati triticale tended to yield a little bit better in the later stages than the wheat did, but there wasn't a lot of difference between rye and triticale. Um, Protein-wise, there wasn't really a lot of differences. Boot stage, they were all about 19, and by soft dough, they were all about 10. Uh, they were fertilized with, if I remember correctly, 60 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, Callie can tell me if I'm wrong on that one. Uh, the other thing I wanted to kind of point out is that Boot stage would be the very highest quality, and so if you need really high quality feed, that's probably the thing to target. And if you targeted boot, you might get it somewhere between boot and anthesis because it only takes about 10 days for it to get there. So if you have a rain event, it'll go through those stages fairly quickly. If you're looking for more tonnage though, milk's probably the stage we don't wanna be harvesting at because we've lost all the forage quality, but we haven't gained any starch yet. So, if you're really looking for tonnage, waiting to soft dough probably makes sense. Uh, we get a little bit more starch, and so we get a little bit more energy as well as a little bit more yield, and so this might be uh, the time to target. All right, uh, again, I'll open it up for questions for anybody who's went so far, and, uh, and we'll see what we can learn from there. So does anybody have any questions for us? Mary, I've got a question. I think it's for Callie, maybe. <clears throat> there were some, obviously, some <clears throat> uh, differences in, in uh, average daily gain between the high moisture corn and the corn silage in grazing. What, what was the diet quality differences between those two? Do you, do you know? <clears throat> I do. I was going to put that in my slide, but then I, then I cut it out because I was talking too long. But I, to tell you off the top of my head, the oats after high moisture corn, they were obviously less mature, so they had a higher quality uh, content. However, cattle weren't able to uh, get enough of those oats in order to produce the gains that they needed. Um, but, uh, so yeah, they both had, both oats in the systems had really good quality, but again, the oats after the high moisture corn, they were, they were more vegetative and so Callie, I think <laughs> one of the things you got to remember, right, is that you remember you told them that you were counting the oats plus yes. Uh, yes. the stover in the high moisture corn system. And so early on, yes, they're eating the oats, but then later in the grazing season, they're only eating stover. And what we know is that if they're only eating stover, um, a growing calf cannot uh, even maintain. Uh, so some of the data that we have uh, from a previous trial says that they lose about a tenth to two tenths of a pound a day when they're just consuming stover. They need more um, protein. And in fact, they need more roomily undegradable protein uh, so 
their diet quality basically as you went along if you noticed the the years where they grazed shorter the gains were better and that's because oats made up a higher proportion of their total diet if that makes sense to you brent that early yep. on they grazed only oats and so the later we went the shorter um, the lower their gains were in fact that one year where we went 70 days you saw that they didn't gain anything and that's because they gained initially and then they lost it all and went backwards during the later part yep thank you kelly Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Mary. Any other questions? I, this is hypothetical for all of you, but this was all done in eastern Nebraska. Do you sense you would see the same results if you did it in uh, North Platte or Scotts Bluff? Okay, so first, Lindsay, you want to you wanna take a stab at that one? Well, I know Scott's bus going to be sandier soils, so lower soil organic matter probably. So, I mean, you may see a, more of a benefit from a cover crop in a more degraded soil. Um, North Platte, what, middle of the state? What kind of soils out there, Sabrina? Um. Kind of depends on where you're at, but um, I can tell you that one of the sites we had out there, it was a loam. What percent organic matter was it good or kind of low or average? Um, average. I think it was about two. Yep. So I don't know if you're going to see much of an impact still if you're using a winter kill cover crop there either. So I'll just point out one, one big thing, right, is that we have that participant precipitation gradient and so uh, your big one Brent I think you know this is that mm -hmm. in our system in eastern Nebraska we could get by with it without irrigating uh, the further west you go you would have to irrigate the cover crop and in fact even when we plant in clay center we often have to irrigate the oats uh, to get enough forage biomass to make it worth it after early harvested corn silage. Yep, and the other thing I guess I was thinking about is days, uh, days with precipitation. Yes. They impact yep. the results a little bit. Yeah, in fact, uh, if you can irrigate and get the forage up, uh, the benefit is probably that you actually have a better experience uh, with the grazing part of it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, snow isn't, isn't nearly as bad as ice, and so you mm -hmm. either want it really cold, um, or you don't want any precip, right? So uh, yeah, I think that there's definitely some key differences there. That's a great question, Brent. Thank you. That's your only good question though. <laughs> okay, well, we'll move on to Sabrina and then we'll open it up again after Sabrina. Okay, 